Hello and welcome to Mostly Vintage Cameras. This is a Minolta Dynax 404 SI, as you can see here. In America this was known as the Maxim STSI and in Japan it was the much more uh, pleasant sounding Alpha Suite S. And this came out in 1999 and at this time uh, a lot of people were talking about digital cameras and they were getting better and better and so there's a little bit of reluctance to spend a lot of money on a film camera when as i say everyone's talking about digital nonetheless people still want to take photographs and the camera manufacturers still need to sell cameras of course so minolta and every other camera manufacturer at this time produced some very good value very well specified cameras for relatively well indeed actual very small amounts of money so this camera as you can see it's in this uh, rather fetching silver finish uh, and it has a color matched lens here this is the 28 to 80 and if memory serves correctly the body with this lens retailed for 299 pounds there was an even less expensive 35 to 80 which retailed at 249 pounds uh, which even in 1999 wasn't a huge amount of money to pay for an SLR now the only issue with this is the 28 to 80 is a little and the 35 to 80 to be fair are a little bit disappointing in terms of performance they were made to be cheap so if you buy one of these today before you do anything else what I suggest you do is you take the kit lens as it came to be known off the camera so it's called a kit lens because in the box you would get the body and the lens all in one box which if you are a consumer electronics retailer somewhere where you might go and buy a refrigerator and a television set and a stereo system all in the same place uh, it meant they could have one box kitted with the body and the lens together they didn't have to worry about computer codes for their till system having a code for the body and a code for the lens and then offer a confusing choice of lenses but anyway we'll get rid of the 28 to 80 we'll put it somewhere safe uh, now I paired this up with this now slightly dusty 28 to 105 which was sort of a mid-range lens and this was quite a, a popular alternative choice for many people so the lens alone retailed for something in the region of 300 350 pounds so you can see that if you buy a 200 pound body it feels a little counterintuitive to spend 350 pounds on the lens but you would get a lens that you would be happy with now because of the price of these lenses of course there aren't that many available second hand you, you will find them um, so other alternatives would be the even earlier 35 to 70 so these 35 70s from sort of 1980s are very much the start of the idea of a kit lens you know the standard zoom lens but by making it a relatively short zoom range you get quite a high quality lens for a reasonable price again on the second hand market today these can be found very reasonably priced and then of course there's the option that's very fashionable and very good and that's just the standard 50 millimeter 1.7 however having swapped out our kit lens for a lens we won't be disappointed in let's go ahead and put some batteries in the camera and start taking a look at some features so the battery cover just on the base plate just need a coin or similar to pop that open it runs on two CR2 batteries which are reasonably common lithium camera batteries I prefer 123A's personally slightly bigger ones but these work perfectly well and it's what the camera takes so we don't get a choice close the cover and twist you can hear it coming to life there so let's go ahead and take a look at some features on the back we've got this simple on off switch or lock on switch um, so we're going to move that to the on position and the little LCD display on the top plate here will light up now 
there aren't any conventional controls on this. There's no aperture ring on the lens. There's no shutter speed dial. So at first glance, this might look a little bit confusing, but most things are controlled from this dial here. So we've got a function button here, or a function dial here, and a control dial here. And we can see at the moment we have program exposure mode, automatic flash, single shot winding. So let's go and take a look at some other options we have. Our exposure mode is on this dial. So if I press the function button and turn here, I can have aperture priority. And in that mode, I choose the aperture and the camera will choose a complementary shutter speed. Shutter priority, I can choose a shutter speed and the camera will choose a complementary aperture. And so it goes on, we've got manual mode. Now here, I'm choosing the shutter speed on the dial and to change the aperture, I need to press, I don't know how well you can see it, this button here. This does quite a few different functions depending on what mode you're in, but in manual mode, that's the button you press to change the aperture. So you press and hold that while turning this. And in the viewfinder, it will give you an indication if you're under or overexposed. And we can see here that at the moment we're underexposed. So if we take a slower shutter speed, so an an eighth of a second at f19, that's not very practical. Let's go for uh, 5, 6. There we go. So when the little symbol get, disappears, that's when we've got correct exposure in manual mode. Um, other modes on this. Well, while we're over here, let's look at the flash button. So the flash. It, well, let's go back into program mode. The flash will pop up and fire if the camera thinks it's needed. If we don't want the flash to pop up and fire, there's a little flash button here. We can push this and we can go from auto. We can force it to come on if we want to do fill flash. Or we can force it to turn off if we don't. So that's the flash mode. Auto, on, off. If we are using the flash, let's turn it back on again, and we move this dial here, we get a red eye reduction mode, so it will have a pre-flash before it fires the main flash, which honestly doesn't work terribly well. You're much better off using a bigger flash unit on the top plate. We'll talk about that a little bit in more detail in a second. ISO, again, if I select the ISO mode, I have to press the function button before I can change the ISO. So you see here it's set to 160 because I was using Porsche 160 in this camera. Normally when I do an overview of a single lens reflex camera, I don't run a film through it for the simple reason that pretty much all single lens reflex cameras will take the same picture and the lens choice will have a bigger influence on the quality than anything else. In this particular case, I happen to go on holiday and I did take some photographs so we'll take a look at them a little bit later. So uh, we can select whatever ISO we need. And again, we'll take another look at that in a moment. And then we get on to some of these slightly more advanced modes. So whilst we're in program here, and I'm just going to turn the flash off again. We've got this button. And these symbols or icons at the top of the display. So there's a mode which is still fully programmed but it's going to be biased towards giving a more pleasing portrait. There's a landscape, a macro, a sports, and a nighttime portrait. Nighttime portrait is basically slow sync flash, so you're going to need a tripod for that. So there's a bunch of little um, options there. Now we can also, if you choose one of these, we can, on this button here again, select some exposure compensation if we think the camera is going to get the exposure wrong. If we don't want single frame winding, so at the moment when we take a picture, it'll wind on one frame. With this button, I can choose a self-timer or continuous shooting. 
So now I've really got myself into a bit of a mess. I've selected a program mode that I'm not sure what it does. I want to use Flash, but I've turned it off. I'm whizzing through film because I've got it on continuous shooting and I've got some weird uh, exposure compensation. And I don't really know what these things are doing because I've just bought the camera, haven't read the instruction book because I'm a bloke, and I just want to take a nice picture without having to worry too much. There is a panic button. That's effectively a reset button. If you press that once, as you heard, it'll turn the autofocus back on. It'll reset it to its most basic operation. Single shot winding, cancel exposure compensation, program mode, auto flash. So we've looked at the exposure modes, the film advance, also the self timer on that same function. Also on this dial we have multiple exposure. So we set the multiple exposure mode, press function and turn that on. And it will take two photographs on the one frame. We can reset that between photographs. So if I take a picture, I can then turn it back on and take another picture and I can reset this time and time again so I can take as many pictures as I like on the one frame. If we have an external flash unit then we can use the WL function that's the wireless function so Minolta had very advanced flash features even before they had autofocus but if you have one of the dedicated flash units the 3500XI for example or even if you had the earlier 4000 AF with the power grip, Pat PG1000, you can have full wireless flash control from your 200 pound camera body, which is pretty remarkable. Now, Minolta didn't get a lot of criticism for moving over to this particular type of flash fitting from a standard flash fitting. And I think it's a little bit unfair because it doesn't really affect that many people. So if you have a simple flash unit with a single pin terminal, well firstly they're fairly inexpensive, so you're not going to lose a lot of money if you can't use that. Plus you've bought a camera with a sophisticated TTL flash metering system and you're using it with a manual flash unit. It doesn't make a lot of sense. If you had an earlier Minolta camera with the regular shoe on, you would be justified in feeling a little bit hard done by because you can't use your old Minolta flash unit on your new Minolta camera. But Minolta did make an adapter called a... what was it? I think it was a CG1000. Pretty sure it was a CG1000. It was a little little cube that uh, converted the old fitting to the new fitting. And if you really had to buy a new dedicated flash unit, as well as the Minolta flash units, there were plenty of third-party flashes from about £30. On the side here, we have a little cover. Pops open. And that takes a uh, CG1000 release, There's a, uh, sorry, an RC1000 release, little uh, electronic shutter release button. They did a short version, which was either 30 or 50 centimetres, uh, and that's the RC1000S. And they did a long version, the RC1000L, which was, from memory, 5 metres, which is quite impressive. So if you wanted to photo fire the camera from a reasonable distance, uh, you could do so. On the back, we've got a spot meter button. It's not, in truth, a spot meter. It's the middle, approximately 9.5% of the focus screen. A true spot meter is one or two degree angle of view. And so this is a, it's not a center weighted partial metering. It is just the center area only. Very handy in very high contrast lighting. If you're shooting at night and you want to expose for a mid-tone that's under a shop window light for example you can take a reading just from that area of the viewfinder so let's open the camera back little catch here pops the camera back open as with most modern cameras there's a a recess runs all the way around the camera back and a little groove runs all the way around the film back so very unlikely to get light leak only this inspection window is likely to give you trouble. So when you first get the camera, you might want to put a film in, take the first four pictures or so, put a bit of black tape over here and take the rest of the film. When you get that first film developed, if the first four pictures are fogged, you know you need to fix the foam rubber seal on the inside. If the first four pictures are fine, 
then you can take the tape away. And that's a simple way of testing if this is light proof without wasting a whole film. The DX coding pins are not quite a full suite, there should be two rows if it was a full suite of pins. So if you are using an unusual ISO film at 160, 500, 320, something like that, then um, maybe just use the manual ISO setting to check that it's working. The ISO range incidentally is 6 to 64,000. So quite a range there. Film loading, quite simple. As with these cameras, they're pretty much universal. There's a little red marker here. You want to put the film leader level with the red marker. And it's quite important to not go too far or too short from that. Putting more leader in doesn't make it more reliable. If anything, it's going to confuse it. So you want to be level with the red mark. Close the back. And away it goes. And it just gives you an indication it's 200 ISO. If I wanted to change that, then I'd go into my manual ISO mode and change it to whatever I want it to, but I would generally recommend using the box speed. Rewinding is automatic. Just to add a quick addition, if you want to rewind the film before the end of the roll, then there is this little button on the back of the camera, and you just press it with this. It will rewind automatically uh, when you've taken the last picture, but if you want to take it out before then, just press that little button in with a suitable tool and it will rewind it prematurely. Uh, Auto focus is automatic at the moment. I've got it on manual focus. But we can switch between manual and auto by pressing this button down here. So now we're in auto. Now we're in manual. Very straightforward. So let's take a look at a few photographs. Now there's a couple that I want to just uh, mention briefly and the rest I'll show as a, as a slideshow. So this 28 to 105 that I've been using is, uh, what are we, f3.5 to 4.5. So at the 28mm end, the maximum aperture is f3.5 and at the 105 end, actually it's a little bit dimmer, and drops down to 4.5. The fashion these days is to have very fast lenses f2.8 and faster and certainly they are available for more money. So if you want to have a 2472.8 please do, it's a great lens. But this first picture is a portrait. The chap said I could use it on social media and YouTube so here it is. Uh, even though it's only f4.5 maximum aperture you can still we can we can see we can still throw the background out of focus. The next picture is one of my favourites on on the roll, slightly desolate scene, and then we can see the difference if you zoom from 28 to 105. And again on this image, we can see um, again controlling the depth of field. So we've just got the the little bit in the foreground sharp on that uh, palm tree and the background is, is blown out a little bit of focus. This film incidentally is Kodak Vision 350D, so it's a 50 ISO film, but I went to somewhere very, very sunny, so it wasn't too much of a problem. And now we'll just have a look at the rest of the poachers. So I think I'd agree that the photographs from this are perfectly acceptable for most people most of the time. With a single lens reflex it really is the lens that's going to make the biggest difference. Um, and that's why kit lenses have such a poor reputation. Now there's a slight confession to make with this. These 404 SIs, they do seem to suffer after all this time with a little bit of delamination of the silvering in the pentaprism. So when you look through the viewfinder you'll sometimes see a sort of oil slick rainbow effect and that's certainly the case with this. Um, it's a little bit disappointing but it doesn't seem to affect the photographs. It may possibly affect the autofocus. I did feel the autofocus 
was not as swift as it was when they were new. It's not bad, but you have to appreciate that we are dealing with a 25 year old camera. So just look out for that. The upside is the cameras are very, very inexpensive. I bought this with the kit lens and the 70 to 200 zoom lens for much less than 50 pounds. I've seen retailers sell them with a, with a sort of kit lens for 100, 100 to 150 pounds, which I think is a little bit steep, but they will have tested it. They will be offering you a warranty and a return period. So really nice little camera. The, the thing with Minolta is the lens mount, the A-series mount, although Sony bought Minolta or Konica Minolta as it was, uh, and they did use this lens mount for a little while on the A100, A200, A58 digital cameras. It has, it has died a death now, there are no more A mount cameras. So it does seem that Minolta cameras on, on eBay and elsewhere don't fetch a lot of money. So you get a lot of camera for a very small uh, outlay. Anyway, I hope this video has been of interest or use. Thank you for watching. I do appreciate it.